I believed all along that we could go wherever we wanted to go as long as everyone believed in him. I mean, he told me the first day I ever met him, Purple was going to Pasadena. I believed in them as much as I knew they believed in themselves. For this season to turn out the way it did, you know, it's, it's like a dream come true. We were relentless in the way that we prepared. And I think that's what we were in 95. We were forced to continue. He's at the 10. He's in for the touchdown. As it is called the Cinderella story. Well, we've had all the romance. Now let's find out if she can dance. Even now, several decades after its remarkable run to the Big Ten Championship and to the Rose Bowl, the 1995 Northwestern football team is best remembered for capturing the attention of the nation. Now, for most people around the country, Northwestern seemed to come out of nowhere. But boy, did they turn heads on a beautiful September afternoon in South Bend, Indiana. The Northwestern Wildcats looking for that elusive season opening game. They haven't won one in a long time. Heavy underdogs here today, but especially on the defensive side of the ball, a veteran team and Gary Barnett with his class of recruits now forming the bulk of the Northwestern players. Tom Hamilton, Bob Trumpy ready for the Irish and Northwestern. You know, Northwestern is a big underdog. They haven't beaten Notre Dame for 14 straight games, but Gary Barnett seems to me to be cautiously optimistic about yeah, this Yeah, uh, Tom, I agree with you, and I think his reason is he has eight returning starters on defense, and over the last several years playing Notre Dame, Gary Barnett's defense has done an excellent job stopping the run. Uh, they control the line of scrimmage against this big Notre Dame offense. So I think Gary Barnett feels that if he can control the run again today, he has some chance to stay close. The expectations outside of Northwestern uh, football locker room were, were pretty low, right? Um, and, and history said that, um, you know, we would finish in the lower half of the Big Ten. Yeah, I don't think there was any real good reason for external folks to have high hopes. You know, we didn't have a great year the year before. You know, most people don't remember that we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ohio State the year before. You know, our record didn't reflect it, but we were poised for a breakout season in 1995. Uh, I remember all of us coming together, working harder than we ever had before. Well, nobody was talking about us, so uh, Notre Dame had all kinds of hype. We knew we had put the work in, and, and we just had to go out there and, and, and play and execute. Um, and, and so we, I think we gained a lot of confidence just from our off-season preparation. Notre Dame at that time was not a team that was going to, like you see today, some of these teams race up and down the field. They wanted to play the same type of game we did. And the fact that we were able to see the momentum early and make them play from behind, you know, it, it played into our hands. And Paulus hands it off on the draw to Kinder from the football pileup, and the Wildcats may have it. In Northwestern football at midfield. Danny Sutter came out of there with the football. First turnover of the season. The fumble that Danny Sutter recovered uh, to put us in position for that first drive. Um, I can only speak for the offensive side of the ball, <laughs> but that put us in a position to uh, march about 40 yards down the field and, and score that first touchdown. Ball just shy of the midfield stripe. Hardly in motion. Schnur hands it off Autry to the 45, the 40, the 35, and he's got a Northwestern first down all the way down to the 33-yard line. Quite honestly, we had a pretty good offensive line that year. You know, all five starters on that offensive line were all Big Ten by the time their careers ended. So we were opening up some holes for them, um, but Darnell's talent level um, played with great leverage. He was always really good uh, after the first contact. When we got into positions where we were controlling uh, the, the line of scrimmage, opening ho uh, holes for him, uh, you know, running a very ball control offense, uh, securing that time of possession, um, you know, th th it was just very validating. He, he was a fun guy to block for. He was a very fun and cool personality, a uh, guy that was easy to like. Uh, but very, very talented. Um, and again, he did not shy away from contact. He was very hard to bring down. Uh, you know, the first time that you hit him, one guy wasn't going to bring him down. And, you know, I think when you've got a guy like that that you're, you're blocking for, particularly in the Big Ten, you go through the gauntlet and he just keeps bringing it and bringing it. Uh, it makes you want to go out there and, and work a little bit more.
we got down, you know, in the red zone, um, and uh, it was, I think it was third down, and we felt like Notre Dame was going to bring pressure, um, and we got up there, and they, and they did, and we had the right, we had the right play called, which was a, a smash route to the corner. Steve threw an absolutely beautiful pass. I, I caught the ball running full speed, uh, and Alan Rossum crashed into me, <laughs> forcing me into the Notre Dame band and uh, upending me. Uh, as I went over the uh, the snare drum, physically it felt horrible, <laughs> crashing into metal objects. Um, mentally, you you just scored a touchdown against your father's favorite team. Um, yes, that was uh, very satisfying. Uh, my teammates ended up having to had having to pull me off of the drum set. Notre Dame's feeling was, you know, here these guys go again. Tusky hanging around at the start of the game, but. Uh... But I think for us, it was a big swing in momentum, and, and we knew that uh, we, had a we had a shot. The Foundation Expect Victory is brought to you by Wintrust, Chicago's bank and official bank of Northwestern Athletics, and by Athletico Physical Therapy. Better for everybody. Back at Notre Dame Stadium with the Northwestern Wildcats have scored first. They lead the Irish 7 to nothing. 50 yards in nine plays after the fumble recovery by Danny Sutter. Steve Schnur, a seven-yard touchdown pass to Dave Beasley. So that was the fourth year of that contract playing them. And again, the three years prior, I, I think year one, we were all terrified. And it showed. <laughs> and they beat the mess out of us. They had Jerome Bettis and a bunch of other, you know, All-Americans that were just uh, ridiculous. I remember the three season openers prior to that and, and how motivating it was to be on national TV playing against a team that was certainly the toast of the town in the city that we were playing in. But hey, we were also a Chicago team, but we were definitely a Notre Dame town. They were in the top of the country, you know, year after year, they were top, top recruiting classes and they beat the heck out of us the few years before. and and they were loaded. We had played them tough for three years. The scores may not have indicated it, but we felt like we played them very tough, particularly in South Bend two years prior. When we played at South Bend, we played them really well. And they, uh, they got a touchdown on us uh, and, and uh, sort of, you know, won the game from that. But we got a lot of confidence from playing that game. Get it done together. Fourth and seven. a big defensive play and Ray Rooney got a piece too. And that was a great tackle by Fitzgerald. You can see him sitting right here. The receiver is going to run the delay right up in front of Fitzgerald and this is a sure tackle. All it sets up, Fitzgerald reads it, bam, wraps him up. He doesn't gain an inch. And Northwestern will take over. We're talking to Gary Barnett. <laughs> Fitzgerald hits one out of the park. The seniors of the class going into 95, they really took control of their process in the off season as far as weight training, getting together and doing seven on sevens and individual drills. We had a team meeting that the seniors, myself being one of them, orchestrated right after the end of the season in 94. The senior class, literally, and there was only seven of us, I think at that point in time, um, maybe 10 on the team, sat at the, um, head of the team meeting room and we basically said every asked every class to step up the juniors the sophomores the freshmen and everybody kind of committed at that point in time to hey we're in this to win it there's no more excuses nobody's missing any workouts we're not uh you know we're not here to lose anymore this was when there was a real systemic shift in college football where instead of going home for the summer guys started staying and, and taking summer school or getting a summer job but more importantly, just working out collectively together. And, and I thought that was the first time, at least here at Northwestern, that we really had committed to that. We had probably three quarters of the team stay up on campus that summer. We worked out together. We ate together. We were always together. We would do these workouts at Mount Trashmore in Evanston, you know, which is an old landfill, these big hills you got to run up. But it was the entire team just going after it. 
right? Pushing each other. Um, but, you know, I'll never forget those days because that's, you know, you put in all the blood, sweat, and tears heading into the season. Uh, the thing that was different was that we were collectively doing it together. As a coach, when you see that happen, you just kind of know that the players have bought in. Because when the players, you know, as a coach, you always kind of say when the players try to take control of the team, you got a chance to win. We knew we were getting better, and we knew that there was continuity. We knew that there was familiarity with what the coaches were asking us to do. We were familiarity with each other just as we grew in, in the fourth year of the Gary Barnett program and era. We knew we had something special. You know, um, there was a there's a fine line between winning and losing, and um, we were right there. We just needed to figure out how to how to convert. It's hard to win a college football game. Very hard to win. If you don't know how, if you've not had that experience, it's really hard to feel through it the first time. And, you know, middle of 94, we're 3-3-1, three, three and one, and maybe we start to think ahead about, hey, we win three of these last four games, we can win a couple of these, and maybe we can make a bowl game. And then to very rudely have that door shut in your face, you know, it was, it was an iterative learning, learning process that came really to fruition beginning with that weekend uh, in South Bend in 1995. Swing it to Kinder. Hit in the backfield. Good reaction by the Northwestern defense, especially the strong safety Eric Collier. So Kevin Kafka, for the first time in his collegiate career, will attempt a field goal. It'll be 35 yards. Charles Stafford will hold. His kick is on the mark. So in his first college field goal attempt, Kevin Kopka puts Notre Dame on the board. There is no mistake on your screen. Northwestern 7, Notre Dame 3, 11-12 left. Second quarter after the field goal, Kopka kicking off. This will be Darnell Autry from the 12. And Autry breaks free up the middle for a moment. He takes it all the way out to the 37-yard line. All of the talk going in was about Notre Dame. And, and I guess you expect that. I mean, they were a top-10 team. They were playing at home. It was their opener. Uh, Northwestern hadn't had a winning season in, what, at that point, 24 years, I believe. Hadn't beaten Notre Dame since 62. There were a lot of reasons to think that Notre Dame deserved to be a heavy favorite going into that game. Well, it was a great story of uh, Gary Barnett uh, was traveling in late June uh, on vacation and he was uh, in the airport and he ran into Lou Holtz. And so they were kind of sitting waiting for a, a flight. And uh, when they interacted, Lou didn't really remember Gary's name and he called him Jerry instead of Gary. And so that really, you know, you know, set a, a, a negative tone for, for Coach Barnett. And he, he made sure that we all were aware of that in August, along with the players. And so there was that, just that feeling of, you know, some disrespect and the aspect like, okay, it's going to be four in a row against the Cats. We were, I think, ranked 109. <laughs> they were ranked number nine. Uh, we were 28-point underdogs. But we stepped on that field believing that we were the best team. You could just feel the whole thing coming together, and you could feel the energy in our football team. And it was, um, you know, I knew that we were going to go in and play our fannies off. And if they didn't play theirs off, we were going to win the game. We'd find a way to win it. You know, I probably remember more of our offensive plays. You know, we got off to a pretty hot start offensively, and you could just kind of feel the confidence on our sideline going up and up and up. And you can kind of feel the angst in the building, you know, as hot and humid as it was. Uh, every every play that our offense made, you know, I, I think our program just got more and more confident. And throw for the completion. First down, Northwestern, 22 of the Irish. Autry, nowhere to go. Bangs ahead for a couple. Ninth play of this drive. Yes, you're right. He played down the significance of this game, unlike the past. Schnur. Bates tried to go back to get it and couldn't. The pass was low and behind him. Northwestern has converted three of six on third and long. Schnur for the end zone and Bates couldn't get there. He'd beaten Alan Rossum, the quarterback, 
Sam Valenzizi, the excellent place kicker of the Wildcats, will try it from 37 yards. The first time that I was ever going to walk into, into Notre Dame Stadium was going to be when I got to play there. And so I remember going out on the field and thinking to myself, you know, all the history that's happened here, um, you know, I'm, I'm now a part of it, my own little piece of it. Uh, and that had also come to the fore the day before. We had, we had done a walkthrough on Friday at Notre Dame Stadium. And while it sounds somewhat apocryphal, it is true that, you know, Coach Barnett did say, you know, look, there's no ghosts here. You know, a little, his, his own Hoosiers moment, I suppose. But there were a group of, of Notre Dame students who came into the stadium uh, while we were in there and they started singing the Notre Dame fight song, you know, during our walkthrough. They shouldn't have been there, but, you know, hey, that's fine. All of us turned toward them and started clapping along with them while they were singing and kind of put it back at them. I mean, nothing really phased us. And I, you know, that sticks out to me. Playing in South Bend is probably as tough a place as I've ever had to play, college or pro. Um, I've always thought that South Bend, uh, Kinnick Stadium, when you get Iowa City, those are the two toughest places that I've personally ever played. And it's because of you don't just play against Notre Dame, but you play against their mystique. You play against their history. You play against looking up and seeing touchdown Jesus. And if you're not careful when you're on the field, and with that darn theme song playing in your head, you will get lost in all that. And I think that's what they want. You know, they want you to get out there and let that moment overtake you. For me, it was weird because I had not done a lot of those. You know, I had not been to, I'd been red shirting. And so I really, it was kind of my first taste of big time football and, and you know, what it looks like and, and what it feels like and sounds like. And it was, it was intense. To give his quarterback a target and it's first down Irish. To the five yard line. And a long Notre Dame drive as Paulus changes the play. Touchdown. Robert Farmer, a five yard touchdown run, and now Kopka to add the extra point. Stafford to hold. Got a little snap. Stafford got it down. Kopka got it. No good. The freshman missed wide to the right on the extra point attempt. Just before halftime with Northwestern clinging to a 10-9 lead. They had some pretty serious questions going into that the first game. Like, didn't know who their starting quarterback was going to be until like a, a week before. In 1994, uh, kind of traded time back and forth with, uh, with another guy. Um, went into the off season, didn't have a great spring, got hurt, was hurt over the summer leading up to 95 and broken my foot. We go into the fall camp now, everybody shows up that's going to be there. Steve Schnurr's in a boot as fall camp started to unfold up in Kenosha. Um, you know, in the first couple of days, I knew as a quarterback coach for years and years and years that we needed to make sure, especially with Lloyd not coming in, we needed to make sure that we, we, said who our starting quarterback was, we believed in him, and we went with him. Steve had the intangibles of a great leader. You know, number one, he was very committed. Uh, you know, number two, he's tough as nails. And uh, all the guys rallied around Steve. And, you know, number three, he's, he's a heady player. He's smart. One of the things that Gary always wanted to do, he wanted to create a physical defensive minded football team as well as a physical offensive minded football team. And so our practices were geared towards stopping the run. And so we developed a hard edge about ourselves. And uh, so uh, when they tried to run the ball on us, they couldn't, they just couldn't run the ball on us. And, and so, you know, when, you, when you're stopping them like that, what happens? the team starts to get more and more confidence, you know. Uh, obviously, our offense sees us stopping them, and, and uh, I would think as, a, as an offensive player, you're thinking, okay, we got to do our part too, which they did. The feeling of us hanging in there, starting to believe, 
And then all of a sudden, as the second quarter moved into halftime, the aspect of, hey, you know what? We're right there with these guys, and we can win this game. Thank you, Coach. Is it the uh, lucky penny that's been a difference today? <laughs> no, we're just, uh, we got a few breaks where kids are playing hard, and I'm proud of the way they're playing, but we tried to train our kids to play a second half now, and so this is one we've been waiting for. Physically, can you stay up with the, you know, the depth and the size of Notre Dame? Well, I hope so. We're having a little trouble on the outside holding the perimeter, but we'll make that adjustment at halftime. Good luck, Coach. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. All right, Gary Barnett and the Wildcats leading Notre Dame in a shocking first half, 10 to 9 from Notre Dame. At halftime of the 1995 season opener, Northwestern found itself leading the number nine team in the country by a score of 10 to 9. A strong off season of hard work had given the Wildcats the confidence to know they could compete with Notre Dame. The question now, could they protect the lead and win the game. Emmett Mosley awaits the Northwestern kick. We were ahead going in and of course that felt good. We felt like we were in control. That uh, We had a few adjustments that we had to make, but uh, nothing major. We had a good second half plan on offense and a good second half plan on defense, Dave, that uh, we knew we had to uh, put to use and, and uh, we were ready to go. A business-like mood at halftime? Really was. Uh, no one in the locker room was uh, surprised that we were ahead. Uh, and uh, we had trained ourselves, trained our team to play a second half. Uh, we'd split our practices so that we could do that. So we were ready to go out. Ron Hollis is sacked for the fourth time. We went after them fairly aggressive, and uh, we brought some pressure on those guys. And I think we, we got after the quarterback pretty good that day. Uh, there's a weapon that we had. We didn't know how good the weapon was. Hudefa. <laughs> and uh, we just kind of unleashed him. And like I said, we, we just didn't know how good he was. I think we had a lot of confidence defensively. I really did. I thought we, I thought we, we went into that game thinking we were really good. We had no evidence. You know, coach talked all the time about having, having faith, which was belief without evidence. And I, and I think we felt like our offense was pretty good that we competed against. We shut them down most of training camp, at least in our mind. Uh, and, and we felt like seeing our offense having success kind of gave us, you know, nobody talked about it, but on the sideline, like, we're, 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 we're going to win this game. And, you know, you kind of came out of the tunnel in the second half feeling feeling like this is our game to win. And, and um, we just didn't know how to win, you know, at that point. You know, we, we knew we wanted to, but we just didn't know how to win. Oh, this is a nice pull. You're going to see some big offensive linemen out in front. They get to the point of attack. This is the counter. Block down strong side. Kick out weak side. Autry waits again. Shows great patience. Pops up through there. Excellent play. Well executed by Northwestern. Autry. I remember when uh, the play was signaled in. Uh, and and we were at the right spot. Snur called the play. You know, I, we had already visualized this touchdown a week ago. Uh, it was just the perfect distance, the perfect yardage, perfect spot on the field where the ball was, kind of the, near the right hash. I had a lot of room to work the corner and get inside for a quick post. Um, I mean, I had the easy part just to run a smooth post route. Snur put the ball perfectly where I could catch it, absorb a hit, and fall in the end zone. I mean... And Barnett was huge on visualization. Like he always, uh, prior to every game, have the entire team go through visualization. Just imagine yourself making that one play that's going to make a difference in the game for the Wildcats. And that was mine. I mean, because I knew we, we had worked that every day in practice. And uh, when that moment came, um, it was almost as if I had already done it already. So, I mean, that ended up being not only my first collegiate catch but obviously my first touchdown as well so what a heck of a way to start a career right in college football stadium with the northwestern wildcats now lead the fighting irish 17 to 9 12 2 to go in the third quarter sam valens izzy with his 37th straight point after touchdown to set a new northwestern record and the wildcats on a picture perfect touchdown pass from steve schner to Dwayne bates the redshirt freshman 
lead it here by eight points. Hey, um, Schnur did a great job because he looked off to the right side and then came back on the post, so there's no question he was going with the post all the way. He looked at the, the, the safety off to the right, but just as importantly, what great protection. He had a nicely formed clinic-type pocket. Nobody in his face was able to deliver the ball with the kind of velocity you need to fit the ball right in there. And then, of course, we talked about, Dave, that great effort catching the ball on the five, hitting one man and dragging himself into the end zone. Well, Bates is as good as advertised. I think we can say that. Randy Kinder back in there, tailback for Notre Dame. He gets, or no, that's Farmer make that, and Farmer's wrestled down as he goes up the middle and a fumble, and the Wildcats appear to have the ball. Casey Daly hit him first. He came from his outside position. The officials have not signaled yet. It is Northwestern ball at the 35-yard line. Casey Daly was the man that made the hit. I remember causing the fumble because I actually, that guy was, I played with that guy in New York. He was a running back in New York, and he fumbled there too and actually got cut. But um, but uh, I, I think, I remember kind of thinking that they're human, you know, that that this is a winnable game, that these are not, you know, these are not giants. These are not, you know, that, that we can win this game. Um, I remember Paulus whining a lot, the quarterback whining a lot. He did not like to get hit, and he would push you off of him and stuff. And, um, you know, I, I just remember that. I, yeah, I had a, I caused a fumble, and that was a big deal. I remember distinctly, you know, practicing that and then it having it actually work. was like, wow, this stuff works. You know, go figure, right? But, you know, who knew? There wasn't a aha moment in the middle of that game where you say, where perhaps your your viewpoint changes from I think we can do this to I know we can do it. We knew going into that game that we had to play well. I'm not going to say that we knew we were going to win. We knew that if we did what we were capable of, that we could win. I feel like we just had confidence. I feel like we had confidence in the coaching staff. We had confidence in each other. Offensively, we had confidence in our special teams and in our defense. If you go back and look at the tape of that game and really at, from a from a coach's or player's perspective, uh, we lined up and we just beat them. There really wasn't anything fancy to it. There weren't, there weren't any trick plays or any fluke things that had happened. We lined up, we played football, and we beat them. And when you do something like that uh, in that environment against a top 10 team, it really, um, you know, if you believe you're good and you go out and prove it, there's some, um, there's some confidence you build in that. I remember that morning we stayed in Michigan City, Indiana, in a Holiday Inn. And I went out for a run, and I came back, and I ran into Greg Meyer, the offensive coordinator, in a stairwell. And he said, yeah, Gary told the kids not to carry him off the field after we win. And I said, okay, <laughs> that, that's, that sounds pretty good. It just came to me. I didn't plan that out. I'm just standing there in front of him, and I, I, I wanted to say something that would sort of break the tension. And I just said, and look, by the way, when we win this game, don't put Gatorade on me and carry me off the field. Act like we've been there before. And you could just see in the room, first of all, it broke the ice a little bit, but you could just see that they went, oh, wow, well, okay. <laughs> I think he believes we're gonna win. I think there was a switch when that happened for some reason. I think that, I think it's like, wow, he, he, really, he really thinks we can win. You know, like this isn't like, it's not just lip service. You know, and so I think when we won, it really just validated all the work and all the, we had suspected we could be good, but you know, who knows? You always suspect you can be good, you know? And sometimes you are, sometimes you aren't, but I think it validated it. The Foundation Expect Victory is supported by Northwestern Medicine, relentless in the quest for better care, and by Under Armour, official outfitter of Northwestern football. It's first down, Notre Dame from their 27-yard line. We also got a lot of rain that year. So when we were up in Kenosha, uh, you know, we, we couldn't have the typical three-a-day Barnett practices that he always wanted. So we actually had to move some of our practices into uh, the, the, the gym there in Kenosha, which was, you know, a, a wood floor. So we're in helmets and shoulder pads practicing, falling all over the place. Managers are 
trying to soak up the floor and just imagine a basketball game with, with uh, you know, with, with football gear on. I mean, guys are falling all over the place. Rob Johnson came to me and he just says, hey, we cannot get ready for Notre Dame by practicing in the gym. So I think uh, he was very <laughs> respectful. He says, I think, as do a lot of other players, we need to head back down to Evanston and so we can practice on the turf. So I said, okay, I understand. And I and you're right, uh, but let's give this another day. Well, the rains quit, and sure enough, we could go back outside. But we they, everybody felt like, I mean, this, this team felt like they were behind, and they needed to be pushed to get ahead. Kenosha was one of the most grueling, arduous things I've ever had to do when Barnett decided to take us there. But I'll never forget, and we, we would go in. And they called it the Kenosha phase because we were, that was when we had like three practices a day. And, we're, you know, we're just, we're just seeing go. I mean, we're just completely out of it. It's hot and tired. Here's Autry being split wide to the right of the formation. Quick look in pass to Bates. And Bates has it and is across the 44 Northwestern first down, tackled by Brian McGee. Boy, that formation just absolutely froze Notre Dame's defense, Tom. They did not know what to do. When Autry went out in motion, it was basically an empty backfield. And he just takes one step away from center. No one on Bates. The closest man is like nine or ten yards deep. We had a guy, Steve Musso, who was an inspirational speaker that had a lot of uh, interesting stories that he used to tell. Um, but he was always trying to help us um, find a way uh, to stay focused and uh, focused on a higher sense of mission and purpose beyond the day-to-day -day grind. When we kicked off the 95 camp, Steve walked in and he was dressed up as Moses. And he... Uh, he walks in, and I didn't know he was doing this. And all of a sudden, he stops in mid-sentence, and he's looking in the back of the room in awe. And here's this, I don't know, ancient man dressed in a robe with a Moses beard and a shepherd staff. And here he comes walking down the alley, the, the, the aisle there of the meeting room, and he just starts hollering out, do you want to go to the promised land? Do you want to get to the promised land? And for us, we knew the promised land was Pasadena, California. So I had no idea. I said, uh, <laughs> Coach Musso, well, what's going on? He says, I'm not Coach Musso. I'm Moses. And I said, okay, Moses, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm here to lead you to the promised land because we've been in a desert for a long time. <laughs> and I, again, we had not talked this over, so I had no idea what he was doing. It's easy to get visions uh, and to visualize and do those things when you've had a lot of success. It's hard to visualize yourself doing great things when you haven't had success. And so I think a lot of our guys were able to, in Kenosha, we were able to, to lock in um, on his messages. And Barnett was very fond of him. He had a great deal of affection for Steve Musso. And he spent a lot of time with us. And I think he was very... Uh, very critical piece to trying to rewire us uh, mentally um, so that we would be able to to take on such just a big task. They're in shock. Absolute, total shock at this situation. Throughout the world of college football, I'm sure, John Burton making uh, an appearance in the Northwestern offense. They're going to work the clock here. Audrey. Flag down. And a hold against the Wildcats. Hold against Northwestern. Well, we had a lot of things happen over the summer uh, that, uh, you know, made it harder for us to maybe get done what we wanted to get done. Um, we lost Marcel Price. Marcel Price was a very talented young man. Again, a guy that was very much an alpha dog. You know, he came in and out of Nashville, Tennessee, and he was going to be one of those guys that you can tell Barnett recruited to be a culture changer. Chris Rooney and I, we lived just off of Simpson and down in, in Evanston. And uh, Marcel came to live with us for a little bit. And I'll never forget, it was, it was right before he was 
going home. It was like the week before we we're going to start training camp, maybe 10 days before we we're going to start training camp. And he's like, you know, he called me C. He'd be like, C, you know, I, I got to get back to the Ville. I got to get back to Nashville. And I was like, you know, still, I was like, Marcel, we, we're about to start, you know, we're about to start camp here in about a week and a half. You sure you want to go back? Like, why do you want to go back? And I'll never forget the last thing is he was walking out our door uh, to leave. The last thing he said to me was, he goes, see, I got to go. He goes, see, I got to go, man. I got to go. We had really encouraged him not to go home for the summer between summer school classes. Um, but he did. And when he went down there to Nashville, he, he just, they, you know, one of his best friends playing with a gun and he dies. Uh, I mean, that that was that really set us back because he was an important part of our team but he was an important part of our team not just as a player but as a as a young leader that was coming up but i think that too uh galvanized our team in a way that even a coach's message couldn't stafford wide to the right side everybody else in tight second and goal at the three notre dame Paulus handing off, Randy Kinder to the goal line, touchdown Notre Dame. Well, here comes the big play of the game. They score, we lose momentum, uh, and they got a chance to tie it up with a two-point play, and, and we get some divine intervention. You know, Marcel Price tripping Ronnie Paulus coming out from center, and, and uh, you know, I, I think that was almost like a for our defense. We had run out of gas a little bit. When Ron Paulus dropped back and, and he was stepped on by his linemen, um, it, it made us all remember that uh, Mar Marcel Price, uh, Big Six, uh, had passed away um, that summer unexpectedly. And we all thought that he had played a hand um, in that place specifically to, to ensure that we were doing that game. Ron Paulus tripped. Nobody touched him as he pulled back from center. Down he went, the play's dead right there, and the Wildcats lead by two. Timeout, 6-16 remaining in the game. Dusty Ziegler, the center, with a towel on his head, got his legs tangled with Ron Paulus, and the two-point conversion failed. Kick off, taking a yard deep and down to the end zone for the touchback. Tom, if we go back to the two-point conversion from behind the offense, we show you Dusty Ziegler. They practice it a thousand times. Here's the center. He's got a reach block on this defensive lineman. The line is sliding right. Watch Dusty Ziegler's right leg as he tries to reach out there for that defensive lineman who's trying to get in the gap. His foot gives way, catches Paulus, knee down, play over. No two-point conversion. When I first got there, we made some, some moves. Uh... We took Chris Martin, who was a receiver, and made him a corner. Took Rodney Ray, who was a running back, and made him a corner. And uh, uh, now, when you do something like that, especially in the secondary, you're going to realize that those guys are going to take some lumps. Those guys on those corners have to be resilient enough to fight through that and to also, at the same time, continue to improve. My sophomore year when we played Notre Dame, Lou Holtz calls an out and up to my side, and it's Derek Mays. And I didn't bite on the out move. It's a double move. Um, I had him pinned, wall to the sideline, just as I'm coached to do, and he jumped right over me, catches the ball to make the play, and I'm just like, there, what? there's nothing else I can do at that point. I, I thought I did everything right, but but make the play. And so – to fast forward, that was my sophomore year. So you go to my senior year now in 95, we come back in. And this is how brilliant Lou Holtz is. We're battling Notre Dame. We are, we are kicking their teeth in, and we're going at them. And wouldn't you believe that right about the same point in the game, Lou Holtz lines up Derek Mays to my side. He runs that same darn out and up that he had got me on two years prior. Um, this time I was there to make the play. And I just remember sort of the game within the game was like, one, how smart he was uh, and just the psychological warfare of trying to get me on the same move and remembering at that point in the game that I was vulnerable to it, uh, but being able to come back and be resilient enough to make it around. That was the personal battle that I had. And our defense that year uh, was phenomenal. They were, they brought a nasty attitude. You know, they adopted this kind of black shirts 
mentality, the dark side. They would wear the, you know, the black jerseys in practice. But we put ourselves in a position to take it to, you know, one of the preeminent programs in, in America. And so, you know, it was interesting because I, it was validation of all that we had been sensing in the years coming up to it, and particularly in the summer, and all that we had been working for. This could be the game. One of my best memories was sitting up in that Notre Dame press box and you know, this is before cell phones, and there is there is a, a phone where people would call in from all over the country to ask questions of their media. And as the game went on, the phone they would just kept saying like Northwestern like Northwestern media, Northwestern media. And they were asking us all these questions. I was sitting next to Lisa Jusick and Mark Simpson, who was my other uh, sports information assistant, was upstairs helping out with the play-by-play. And they were asking us all these questions, things that I had no idea. When was the last time you did this? When was the last time you did that? When was the last time? And I told the guys before the game, I'm like, if we win, I'll do cartwheels down the back of the press box there. <clears throat> and so Mark Simpson comes down with like eight minutes to go in the game, and he taps me with like, during a timeout, and I'm like, what do you need? And he said, are you lumbering up? I'm like, what do you mean? Because you're going to have to start doing cartwheels. Schnurl will pass for it. And he has his man Bates. And that will be a Northwestern first down. Wait a minute. This is a team that was three seven and one last year. This is a team that, that starts a fullback. This is his first start. That kid that just cut the ball, caught the ball, was a converted quarterback. This kid sat. The quarterback sat for eight games last year at Northwestern. This this football team has has grown in this last three hours by years, not minutes. And now they just need to put the finisher on it. Just all of a sudden how quiet it got in the Notre Dame press box. They were all chattering the whole time. And then when it, when it became evident that we were going to win and they were going to lose, just the shock of everybody in that press box, in, including ourselves a little bit. Darnell Autry, late in the game, they are trying to run out the clock, almost scored. Uh, got run out of bounds, got a first down to pretty much – since the game for them. I mean, they, they got the ball after after Notre Dame turned it over on fourth down. I think they ran out the last four minutes of that game. And it was mainly Darnell. And uh, our, our booth was right next to our coach's booth. And we're watching the, the play clock and the game clock and trying to do the quick math and, and figure it out. And all of a sudden, you get the realization that Holy smokes, they don't have to snap it again. The game's over. And I've never heard noise like I heard from the coach's booth next to us, pounding on the table, pounding on the walls. Just this huge roar went up. And remember, the rest of the stadium was pretty much dead silent at that, at that moment. And I heard this thunderous noise from the booth next to us. And I, I thought, man, are those guys ever happy? And you just realize all of a sudden, They've just done something that that probably most people around the country who follow college football thought was unthinkable. They've done it! The Northwestern Wildcats have upset the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Big time! It's That's all it. over! And Northwestern has beaten Notre Dame for the first time since 1962. Coach Barnett's like walking uh, to shake hands with Lou Holtz, and I think I ran right in between them. And I looked right in the camera, the main camera, and I went, Shh. and then that was it. And then I took off. It kind of became an instant Cinderella story, right? I remember Steve Schnurr was on Good Morning America the next day. Um, you know, it just became like the story of the, of, we shocked the world, essentially. Yes, are you, are you with me down here, Tom Evan? Yes, like Coach, can you describe the I've seen this thing so many times in the last three weeks that I, it just feels normal. I mean, I've, our whole team has seen this over and over and over. Well, you know, I, I expected it to happen. Give your experience.
experience to win like this in your life. I know you had some big wins when you were. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is nice. This, this is, is nice. Cool. This is pretty nice. What does it mean to your program? I don't know. We've got another game to play next week, but I know we'll be pretty fired up to play it in two weeks. And uh, you know, it's just got to send a message to everybody that, that our kids can play with anybody, and I think we just did. You certainly sent a message, Coach. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate that. I wanted to show the team that I could play, and then I could, you know, support them as much as they supported me. It's kind of hard to put it into words. I think uh, I think this you know big 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 turning uh, turning point for our program. You know, we uh, this is something you dream about since you're a little kid. And I mean, guys are in there hugging, crying. I mean, it's it, it's a great feeling. It was neat to see players just rise to the occasion. It was great to see um, Schnur uh, shine the way he did. And we were coming onto the scene. I think it was a surprise for a lot of people. It, it wasn't a surprise for us. I think the only difference was, was that it was finally happening.